So you can see it? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I can see it. All over the place. I got you and everything in the field of view. All right. Before we begin this presentation, throughout the entirety of the raw footage, we misapproximated the distances at every single location throughout the entirety of the expedition. And until the expedition was completely finished, did we recognize this error. That being said, our findings are so significant and we are so thoroughly convinced of the outcome that we are sharing it here today with you. This is our home state, Alaska, and this is Lake Tustamina on the Kenai Peninsula. Me and a friend um, went out and did an experiment, and we had gracious help from a dear friend of mine and a relative of my friend, um, John. He helped an awful lot, and we couldn't have done it without him. So here's where we actually came out to the lake. On the left of the screen, you can see where we came in, and that's after riding 5.7 miles or so through just straight wilderness. And that's after hauling all of our sled and gear out to the point to where we could actually drive out to here. And we carried a lot of gear out here, didn't we, Scott? What did we haul out here? Oh, yeah. Well, I would guesstimate probably two, 300 pounds pretty easily. Uh, fuel, generator to... Camera equipment. I mean, shoot, we had a bunch of stuff. We had tools for the sled we had to haul out in case we were walking out of here. Yeah, hey, uh, toolboxes, some some self defense items. Yeah, and this is food. this is the first day that we're watching at this pan here. This was actually the the first day we went out. We went out several days to record all of this. Now, most of this video was shot on two cell phones. Well, I mean, one of the two cell phones. And then later on, we went through and did a little editing. I'll let Caleb talk about that, though. So we used two programs in particular. One of them's some video stabilization software called FSTAB, and the other one's Dane AI. And that one is for smoothing up the frame rate, particularly of this pan we're watching now. Once we're out in the woods, we're the only two crew out there, and there's not enough time in the day for perfecting every move we took. Also, in the raw footage, over the span of the days we were out there, we shot two different locations as well, other than this furthest point. This is the furthest point of the three locations at which we shot the laser. We got some high visibility tape up in the tree and on the ground there. That was us. We were just more or less marking out where we need to stop. We also high vis taped the Udelhoven Memorial tree as well. Once more, we are so very thankful we were able to come out to this lake, despite the monetary expenses involved, despite the immense amount of voluntary and gratuitous labor involved, the amount of variables which had to line up perfectly right for any of this to happen is so far beyond my scope and understanding that only a miracle is a proper analogy. So this is me on the ice, looking at his belly button. That's near and about eye level. And when we're shooting the laser, the beam is visible here on this nearest snow machine track to the camera. Which is only at most two and a half feet off water level, ice level. We also wanted to take a moment to thank our dear friend for letting us borrow her snow machine. It, this thing is a ripper. Much appreciated. Rolls Royce of sleds. Throughout the ride, there's a couple of moments where the video glitches or there's a little bit of digital tearing. This is because of the video stabilization software that we ran this time lapse through. Also, the entirety of the snow machine ride in real time with only the physical video stabilization applied is being uploaded alongside the raw footage. Now, over the course of the days that we were out here on this lake, I personally got real familiarized with the lake. You made this trip a whole lot more times than I did for sure. Yeah, a couple. Now, we crossed the lake here at the beginning to get to the shore. It may not be obvious to you guys, but to me and Caleb that were on the sled, there's quite a bit of water here as we're crossing the lake to get over to the shoreline, and that's honestly why we opted to take the shoreline pretty much, pretty much the whole Yeah, way. exactly, majority of the way there. So at the end of the third month of the year, we had quite a few warm days already and we were not venturing out any further into the middle of the lake on only a few inches of ice. Most of the video that we've recorded for bringing you out to the lake is captured on separate days than when we shot the laser. The temperature dropped below freezing the night before and the entire day of the laser shoot. 
The weather was overcast, blocking the sun throughout the entirety of the day. Thankfully, the clouds blocked the sun from vaporizing the snow, or sublimating the snow. Sublimation is when snow becomes air humidity without first becoming a pool or puddle. With the ambient air temperature below freezing and even across the entire lake, with no direct sunlight for sublimating snow, we are within perfect conditions for maintaining the straight and true trajectory of our beam. Almost every day we went out to the lake, we set aside a very large amount of time for setting up the telescope, attempting a continual pan from the laser sight to the target location. However, after several unforeseen difficulties, such as incredibly poor radio performance, incredibly poor cell reception at the laser site, and me personally making a blunder at the telescope during the best pan we had had to that time, we sadly walked away from the lake having not accomplished that goal. This plane isn't 80 feet off the ice. You ready? Oh, yeah. The tree with the high visibility wrapping which we are now leaving is the Udelhoven Memorial Tree. This tree, at its shortest surface traveling distance, is three miles away from the laser site. Over off on our right hand side is Caribou Island, which we continue catching glimpses of as we continue traveling beyond the island and further down the lake. We did have a purpose for coming out to this lake other than simple shenanigans of let's go fire a laser. We are aware that most people do not have access to such a large lake or have no means of actually traveling to these lakes who might be interested in any of these experiments. There are an uncountable number of barriers for almost anybody performing such scientific observations for the public without private interest money or government money, direction, and oversight. We are also aware that big government, with the cooperation and participation of the public-private corporate sector, is actively suppressing true field observations and earth measurements. With the hyper-compartmentalizing of society, the counterintelligence sector of the Leviathan military-industrial complex is now firmly in control of public perception. We are now arriving at a small warming fire from Scott. Scott's fire is located at the bottom of the bluff which we passed the face of not too long ago. The shortest surface traveling distance to this fire is about 4.7 miles. We did make a few observations from this position, all of which are available in the mundane raw footage. The night we actually shot this, this part here, I was actually standing there for a while. I believe Caleb might have been getting the culminator lens hooked up and dialed in a little bit. And that's where we kind of did that at here. And I ended up starting to fire. My feet got a little a little cold and a little wet from the, from the water and crossing and whatnot. But a good time. 
We didn't get that culminator dialed in 100% though. It was really shaky trying to adjust that thing and also hold it in position because at this point we're shooting almost five miles. So even barely touching the laser at this point puts a lot of movement in the beam. And I believe this night, I believe you were freehanding this yes. position like 100%. 100%. It was on a terribly uneven wooden tripod at the time. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, those rocks kind of killed it. A couple of quirks about Lake Testamina, which are not immediately obvious, is warm springs under the lake, which continually bring warm water into the lake throughout the whole entirety of winter. The lake is glacier and stream fed, and during the thaw, these streams often flood, washing water up over the ice. We call this overflow. The shoreline, though, is quite a bit different in depth of snow in a lot of different places varying by the sunlight which hit it and the warmth of the ground and material directly beneath it. We are now about three quarters of the way through the time lapse. We used two different calculators for determining the amount of curvature present at 10.3 miles. The Omni calculator does not apply any corrections for a theoretical increase in view distance on a globe, so is only provided for informational purposes. The primary calculator is created from the model presented on behalf of NASA from San Diego State University hosted on the NASA Astrophysics Data System accessible at harvard.edu and applies the correction for any lensing caused by the air medium we are viewing through, which only in theory might increase view distance beyond the horizon of a globe. Our laser is 4 foot above the ice. The laser's horizon is 2.65 miles away. The target location from the laser site, with the generous helping of refraction applied, is hidden below 32.96 feet of curvature. Accounting for the size of our beam, and assuming we aim directly at the horizon, which we were actually aiming slightly above the horizon, the bottom of our beam hits 12.5 feet above Scott's head. Scott's horizon from his eyes 8 feet above the ice is 3.76 miles away. The laser location from Scott's position is hidden below 24.13 feet of curvature. At no point should any signal from Scott be visible at the laser site and only the glow from the laser beam coming over Scott's horizon 3.76 miles away coming from the tree line behind the laser 10.3 miles away which is at most 20 feet above the laser site can be visible as well as 12 and a half feet above Scott's head where the beam hits. We came onto the lake with the foreknowledge that were the beam source visible, that the water froze in a non-spherical form. So were the beam source visible, the water never had spherical form. In the big final push to send him out and having no comms to call him back after noticing I didn't send him with the tape measure and not hearing from him until after he rode out 10 miles, we kind of gave up on the whole tape measure. So where I was, the at the target location, the laser's destination, if you will. The beam itself was 25 feet high by 20 feet wide. I didn't have a tape measure on me at the time. I didn't bring it um, or, or a grid scale or anything like that. So, but me and Caleb's review of the footage afterwards, we're, we're pretty, pretty confident that pretty we're- Pretty confident that our guesstimation is right around i mean within a foot and the beam itself has a milliradian of 0. 0.403 which is pretty darn good for a blue 450 mm -hmm. nanometer seven watt laser absolutely when we came out here on the 28th with the overcast and the cold weather leading up to the point, our thermometer checked 28 degrees two times. And we're out on the lake at the foot of a glacier. It was pretty cold. So we also have two weather sites that we visited. Uh, one of them's a fishing report, which we don't know where they're getting their data from, though it's for Tustamina Lake, and timeanddate.com, which shows for Kasila, and is actually the weather station in Kenai, which is much further away from Tustamina than Kasila. So by now we're starting to lose daylight, and it's time for me to head out on the snow machine. And uh, so that's what I do, and I get out there, and uh, I turn the snow machine right around and point the headlight 
back towards Caleb. And it's perfectly to. visible from my side. He said he pointed it towards me on the phone, and it's like, yeah, it was clearly, clearly seeable. is clearly on the actual lake below the tree line the globe is a lie now we have the laser connected to like what you would have on a spotting scope type of mount so any little tiny movement and the beam just goes everywhere especially at 10 miles yeah that's that whipping you see is when the mount was let go of just me holding it would shake the mount so because we're aiming this laser by hand, when releasing the tightening mechanism, it would relax the tension and shift the mount slightly off target. And so we had to tune this in to where when let go, it aimed at the target. The snow machine headlight is what we sighted the beam on. standing actually on the lake there's the there's the laser there's the telescope but I messed up Come on back. you so much for letting us go out on the lake this year thank you so much for providing the building blocks for making this video for providing the weather for the temps for fixing our mistakes when we made many jesus thank you so much and we ask that maybe were you willing and we're still here that we go out and shoot the 19 and a half mile mark for everybody else next year 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. For anyone interested, curious, or unawares, here is a censored documentary exposing multinational media companies and world governments conspiring against the multitude of Earth. Jesus, my Father, he gave me a purpose, and he gives purpose to any that call upon his name and fear him.